During his reign, Spain became the leading European power. Culture and science flourished in a prosperous golden age, fueled by an empire where the sun never set. The question is, was Philip II a good king? Philip was born on May 21st, 1527 in the city of Valladolid. His dear father, Charles I, was often absent during his childhood, while his mother, Isabel of Portugal, provided close care and guidance. As lovely as his Portuguese mother was, the young prince did receive a strict education, which explains his reserved and serious nature for his age. Charles did recognize Philip's talents from an early age. At just 16 years old, Charles entrusted him with the temporary regency of Spain. Philip devoted himself to hunting, religious practices, and his strict education. He was so mature that that same year, he also married Maria Manuela of Portugal. This marriage was opportune for Philip, who, like his great-grandparents, the Catholic monarchs, wanted to unite the peninsula. Unfortunately, Maria died two years later while giving birth to their firstborn, Charles of Austria. This first marriage was not ideal. Their son, Charles, had four grandparents instead of the usual eight, which explains why Charles was the way he was and why he caused so many problems for Philip in the future. But we'll talk about him later. Philip continued his duties as governor and traveled around Europe visiting his future European territory. But in 1554, Philip set his sights on England and saw a unique opportunity for Spain. England had separated itself from the Catholic Church in the 1530s so that Henry VIII could divorce Catherine of Aragon. It was clear then, given the animosity towards the French and the Protestants, Mary Tudor, the new Queen of England, and Philip II, the future King of Spain, would unite and marry in 1554. Thus, technically, Philip was the King of England, which, of course, he took advantage of and exerted influence in the English government. The main goal of this marriage was the reintegration of England into the Catholic Church. Two years later, Charles I of Spain and V of Germany abdicated, and Philip was now King of Spain. Philip inherited Castile, Aragon, Navarra, the Low Countries, the Franco County, the kingdoms of Naples, Sicily, Sardinia, and the Lordship of Milan, and all the territories conquered in America. However, don't forget the enormous debt that would fall upon Philip, as his father loved war, but not finance. Spain ended up at war against France again in 1557. The new pope, Paul IV, didn't like the Spaniards, especially those stationed in Naples. Because of this, the pope formed an alliance with the king of France, Henry II. But Philip II defeated them easily in Italy, and later in 1557, Spain gave the final blow to France in the Battle of San Quentin. This battle was a clear victory for Spain, as the French lost around 12,000 soldiers between wounded and dead, and Spain only lost 500. A few months after this victory, Philip II's wife, Mary Tudor, better known as Bloody Mary after her reign of terror, died. Philip, who honestly didn't care much, took advantage of the peace with the French in 1559 and included in the treaty his third marriage to the daughter of the King of France, Isabelle de Valois. Philip wanted to commemorate his victory at Saint Quentin and ordered the construction of a new palace in the outskirts of Madrid. In 1563, constructions began for the monastery, palace, royal pantheon, and cultural center that we know today as the Royal Monastery of San Lorenzo del Escorial. Due to his personality, Philip had the tendency to isolate himself. This palace, located away from the people but close to Madrid, became the king's favorite residence. I really recommend visiting El Escorial if you're in Madrid, as it gives you an idea of what Philip II's reign prioritized. But how was Philip II as a person? Philip was calm, prudent, very religious, hardworking, but he was also bureaucratic. This ended up hurting his reign because almost all the decisions had to pass through him or his entrusted advisors. The problem is, Philip didn't trust almost anyone, creating an administrative delay that hindered the administration of his reign. Nevertheless, El Escorial and its art collections, its great library with literary works, books of science, and information from the New World, cartography, theology, all of this reflects the importance that Philip II gave to culture and science in this Renaissance Spain. Miguel de Cervantes began writing his early works. The place of Lope de Rueda filled the theaters, and El Greco's paintings hung in Philip II's chambers. Spain became the leading power in Europe, but not only culturally, but also economically. The urban population began to grow, but despite constant immigration to the American colonies. America was beneficial to the Iberian Peninsula in many other ways. Trips to America inspired new studies in social and natural sciences. Navigation and exploration led to the creation of the Academy of Mathematics in Madrid, which in turn also benefited the Spanish Armada, 
In America, territories continued to expand. In 1565, Spain colonized Florida, and between 1565 and 1569, the Philippines, named after Philip II, were conquered. But there's more. Attempts were made to find El Dorado, and in 1576, the Spanish became the first Europeans to set foot in New Zealand. There was also something else that was very interesting, which was the investigation into the possibility of invading China. They were thinking of doing it exactly the same thing that they did in Mexico, just invading them. They, they thought that they could do the same for China. However, while Philip's life continued, things began to get a little bit more complicated. The year 1568 was probably the worst year of his life. Starting on July 21st, a conflict erupted that was inevitable. His father, Charles V, was born and raised in the Low Countries. And while Charles inherited his empire in Europe, the Low Countries watched him with pride. But after his abdication in 1556, the Dutch no longer liked the idea of a king born and raised in Castile, who couldn't even speak their language, ruled their lands. Moreover, the Low Countries, located near England and Germany, quickly embraced Protestantism, and some nobles like William of Orange aspired to independence. When in 1566 the Protestants began causing trouble, Philip sent the Duke of Alba to suppress a rebellion with 10,000 soldiers. These rebellions developed into a war that we now call the 80 Years War, because it began in 1568 and then ended in 1648. This was a long and very costly war. The usual spending habits of war had already been bleeding the public treasury, but this particular war also ruined the wool export industry, which was essential to the Spanish economy. The conflict was somewhat contained in January 1577. The Perpetual Edict calmed the situation for about seven months. But that same year, the Eternal War reignited. Let's go back to the terrible year 1568. The Eighty Years' War began in May, and in July, Charles of Austria died. So, if you remember, that son that Philip II had, well, he only caused problems. From an early age, his health was already delicate. When he was 17, he fell down the stairs while chasing a servant. He hit his head and had a hole drilled in his skull. His madness only got worse. Charles began to mock his father. He attempted to stab the Duke of Alba in public, and when throughout 1567, Charles plotted a rebellion against his father and prepared to escape, Philip II had enough and executed a plan to imprison his son. On the night of January 18, 1568, Philip II silently surrounded Charles's room with an armed group. They imprisoned him in his own room, and later, he was transferred to a tower in the old Alcazar of Madrid. A few months later, Charles decided to start a hunger strike, which ended rather quickly, and then he decided to go the opposite direction, which some historians theorize was the cause of his death in July 1568. Two months later, the worst that could possibly happen to Philip happened, and Isabel, his third and undoubtedly the wife he loved the most, passed away. As I said, the year 1568 was not his best year. Philip fell into a deep depression, alone once again, and returned to his residence in El Escorial. Well, at least now, Philip could celebrate Christmas, open the present. Hey there, um, this is the Moriscos of Valencia, and, and they're not happy because the Archbishop of Granada wants to take away their customs and traditions, supposedly because they cannot become true Christians. This confrontation with the church meant that from Christmas of 1868 until mid-1567, the crown fought against 30,000 armed men in the Alpujarra of Granada. The battles were quite bloody, and the conflict ended with a fierce repression that included the expulsion of the Moriscos from Granada. In 1570, Philip decided to marry his niece, Anne of Austria, his fourth and final wife. Philip fell in love with her quickly, even more so when she gave him several sons, of whom only one survived, future King Philip III. But hey, Philip now had an heir who didn't mock him or conspire against him. The death of the great Ottoman leader, Suleiman the Magnificent, in 1566, brought Selim II to power, also known as Selim the Drunk. The drunk guy conquered Cyprus from the Venetians in 1570 and supported the Moriscos in Spain between 1568 and 1571. The Venetians asked for help from the Christian powers, who ignored them. But then the Pope said, look, I'm in charge here, and united Spain, Venice, and the Papal States in a holy league to stop the Ottomans in the Mediterranean. Philip sent 300 ships, 34,000 sailors, and 36,000 infantry soldiers led by the experienced Don Juan of Austria to the Gulf of Patras in Greece. This battle could be a video of its own, but in summary, only 30 Ottoman ships survived, and 30,000 Ottomans died or were wounded. A young soldier named Miguel de Cervantes said the battle was the highest occasion that the past, present, or future times ever saw. While many Spaniards were captured, the Battle of Lepanto in 1571 remained in the memory of the Ottomans 
as it demonstrated who truly dominated the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, in 1577, Anne of Austria, his last wife, died of the flu. Philip, likely enjoying the views from Elis Coriel, reflected on his situation. Rebellions, too costly war, poor wives, a family with many misfortunes, Philip needed a victory. If you recall, Philip's mother, Isabella of Portugal, was Portuguese, and Philip II also felt Portuguese. It was time to fulfill the dream of the Catholic monarchs and finally unite the Iberian Peninsula. The pieces aligned perfectly. In 1552, his sister Juana married Don Manuel of Portugal, who died two years later. Juana was left a widow and pregnant with the heir of Portugal, Sebastián, who was a mystic obsessed with invading and conquering Africa. This doomed him as he died at the age of 25 during an expedition to Morocco. At this point, the closest heir to the Portuguese throne was his great uncle, Henry. When Henry died in 1580, Philip II became the legitimate heir to Portugal. Of course, the Portuguese resisted, but between 1580 and 1583, Philip invaded Portugal and proclaimed himself king in 1580. The empire that Philip now possessed, which included the Portuguese colonies in Africa, India, and Brazil, was so immense that the sun never set on it. But Philip was not completely satisfied. There was still something bothering the king. And that was England, full of Protestants, which also aided the Dutch and had a guy named Drake who was plundering Spanish ships in the Indies. The Queen of England, the fierce and very Protestant Elizabeth I, had taken her niece Mary Stuart as a prisoner, who was Catholic and considered by many as the true heir to the throne. In 1587, Elizabeth I called for the execution of Mary Stuart, and Philip ordered the preparation of a fleet so vast and formidable that it was nicknamed the Invincible Armada. The plan was simple. A fleet of 137 ships and 30,000 men, led by the Duke of Medina Sodonia, would depart from Lisbon in 1588 with the aim of landing in England and quickly attacking London with the army of Flanders. The fleet sailed as planned in 1588, but it ran into a couple problems upon reaching the English Channel. The Spanish fleet encountered storms, made worse by the English fleet which attacked them with modern, fast and better armed ships. The Spanish Armada, already defeated, had to retreat around Ireland due to the winds. During this journey, the Armada lost numerous ships and soldiers. After the return of the Armada to Spain, Sir Francis Drake attacked Lisbon in 1589. This attack did not succeed in taking the city, but caused quite a bit of damage. Two years later, the English conducted an expedition to the Azores, where they captured several Spanish ships and seized a large amount of wealth. In 1596, Philip II organized the fleet to counterattack the English. Queen Elizabeth I responded in the same way, attacking Cadiz again and failing, but causing harm. Finally, the English did not succeed in taking Puerto Rico in 1598, and in 1604, the conflict ended with the Peace of London, which ended hostilities between Spain and England. The trouble's not over, though. In 1590, the king was alerted of conspiracies and assassination attempts at his court. Antonio Pérez, a former secretary of the king, was arrested for his involvement in the murder of Juan de Escobedo. Antonio Pérez fled to Zaragoza, where Philip tried to persecute him through the Inquisition to prevent him from going under the laws of Aragon. This caused a revolt in Zaragoza, which Philip II suppressed with force. So, how in Sol. But, where's Antonio? During the revolt, Antonio Pérez was able to escape to France, where he lived for 20 years. During these 20 years, Antonio devoted himself to writing and telling stories about Spain, much of it in a negative and exaggerated light. These stories, which were printed and shared throughout Europe, damaged the image of the Spaniards and their leaders. In the final years of Philip II, the monarch suffered from gout, which caused him terrible pain. When he saw death approaching, he ordered to be transported in a long and painful journey to his residence at the Escorial. There, the most powerful monarch of all time died in 1658, at the age of 71. What do you think? Was Philip II a good king? <laughs>